Good evening, everyone. I'm Professor Kevin Jones, Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science and Engineering, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you tonight to another one in the Professorial Inaugural Lecture Series. So for those of you not familiar with the idea, historically, professor being the highest rank in the academic standing was something you achieved after many years of expertise being demonstrated within your field. <clears throat> and at that point, you got to profess, which means you get to talk to others about what it is you are expert in. So I think that's a wonderful tradition to preserve. And we try to ensure that all of our newly appointed professors get the chance to profess to an audience. Now, this is probably the most difficult lecture Mark will ever do. No pressure, but he's talking to everyone from people who happen to know him and have no idea whatsoever what it is he really does, so thought they'd come along to find out, to people who are expert in the field, looking for reasons to find holes in whatever's been said tonight. So, you know, no pressure whatsoever. And I'm sure that he'll, um, he'll live up to both aspects of that, informing and educating those who are just interested in what it is a professor does and how he got here, but also those of you who are interested in where he is now and what it is that he'll be doing in the future. So having set sufficiently high expectations, and you will, of course, ensure that he lives up to them, I'll now pass over to John to give far more detail about Mark. Thanks very much, Kevin. Good evening. Hello. My name's John Shaw. I'm a professor of geography and I'm the head of the School of Geography, Earth and Environmental Sciences here at the University of Plymouth. And I can just see the rapture across your faces as you realise you're getting two support acts rather than just one uh, this evening. <laughs> now, our, our school, uh, Geography, Earth and Environmental Sciences, as the name would indicate, is a pretty broad church. And I'm looking forward to learning an awful lot this evening from Mark. Uh, at first glance, environmental chemistry is about as far away as it gets from transport geography, which is the kind of thing that I do. But both of us, and indeed everybody across the whole school, are primarily interested in addressing grand challenges that present themselves to the environment and society. And it's Mark's opportunity tonight to tell you all about his work, but I'm sure you'll know already that he's a leader in the field of the interactions of nitrogen and other chemical compounds in the marine and terrestrial environments. The chemistry, the SOGI staff coming late, honestly. <laughs> now, Mark's attitude neatly exemplifies, I think, the connections between the human and the physical sciences within the school. As you'll have heard when you came in uh, with the fiddle music playing, uh, and as you'll know, Mark is indeed a fiddle player. And I know that something that uh, his violin teacher told him a while ago resonates, that it's okay that if you strive for technical excellence, but you also need an emotional connection. And Mark is often keen to point out that you have to have imagination and passion uh, to succeed in your scientific endeavor. Now, Mark comes from County Down and came across the water to Liverpool to do his BSc in Chemistry and Oceanography. He stayed in Liverpool to do a PhD before coming to Plymouth first at the Marine Biological Association and then going up to Middlesex and then coming back to Plymouth, now the University of Plymouth, in 2001, which means, Mark, that you've been here longer than me, which is quite an achievement and very well done on that, on that front. <laughs> now, you'll know, some of you in the room, that Mark's work has pushed boundaries in analytical and methodolo methodological development in investigating the impacts and environmental pathways of um, pharmaceuticals in rivers and waterways, and most recently in approaches to soil degradation, producing soils from inert waste materials. Now, I've, like I'm sure you as well, have always known Mark as a magnificent asset to the school and to the university. And obviously he's a magnificent scientist, or we wouldn't be here today celebrating his achievements. But he's also a great bloke too, and he's the first, as a very humble and generous man, to admit that all of his achievements have been working alongside others 
uh, in the decades that he uh, has got uh, leading up to, to here tonight. But tonight is Mark's night. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Mark Fitzsimons. reminds me of something I'm going to talk about later. <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you very much, Kevin and John, for those uh, very kind words, and thank you everyone for coming here tonight, um, both in person and online. It's, uh, I'm very privileged uh, to have you here, coming here in this uh, less than optimal weather for Plymouth. And uh, those of you that are joining online, got um, brothers and sisters, cousins, uh, friends, and uh, other colleagues who are uh, coming in. Hello to you, and special hello to my cousin John, whose birthday is today. That's a good omen. Happy birthday, John. <laughs> okay, so um, today I want to talk to you about nitrogen. I've got a... Uh, a title and, and description that has been placed on this element and uh, I'd like to talk about its, um, how wonderful it is, how essential it is, but also some of the challenges that our, our use of it and our own ingenuity has brought. Okay. No. Okay. I'm out of lecturing uh, mode. <coughs> So, as John mentioned, I come from um, County Down, north of Ireland, or Northern Iron, <laughs> um, from a town called Newcastle, which is nestled in the, oh, just at the foot of the Mourne Mountains, um, a lovely place to grow up, and uh, the inspiration for the Chronicles of Narnia that were written by C.S. Lewis, who grew up in Belfast. Um, the, this is me watching the moon landings with my sister, big sister Lelia, or maybe it was Top of the Pops, we're not sure, and also my trials for Newcastle United in the back garden. I chose academia. So preparing this, as, as I mentioned, it's, it's a, a milestone, and I was thinking about perhaps some reasons and, and things that might have influenced um, how I got here. And I um, was thinking about when my father's from County Down, another coastal village called Ardglass, but my mother's from rural County Derry. And our summer holiday was a trip to rural County Derry, a, a town called Draperstown. And I remember these, what seemed interminable car journeys at, at that stage. Um, and one way of, of trying to find out where we, where we were, when we would get there, was looking at the change in the soil, when it would change to this uh, pink iron-rich soil west of the River Ban. And also thought um, about the, the Sperrin Mountains, which is this green area, where, uh, and why the fields almost went up to the summit of the mountain there, while in the morns they were very much in the foothills. Um, going from left to right, my... Auntie Angela um, bought me a, um, The Silent World by Jacques Cousteau for my 11th birthday, remember, at Coleraine Market. And um, probably because I was talking about the, the documentaries on the, that was on TV at the time. Um, and uh, she very kindly uh, thought about that for me. But also, we used to get our comics every Friday. My father would bring us to the shop. And he also picked up Look and Learn, Wise Man. And although it was quite dense for a, for a young child, there was always, I used to dip into it and see some interesting stories, maybe about dinosaurs or um, a history of dentistry. 
also <laughs> comes to mind. <coughs> um, we're in the medical building. And lastly, um, my Uncle Pat and, and Auntie Margaret used to go on these uh, on journeys to different spots in the world. And um, Uncle Pat used to create a slideshow that he would give to us when he came over to Ireland. And uh, I remember their first one, uh, their first one was uh, to the Amazon. And uh, I remember a slide um, explaining about the mixing of these two rivers, the River Amazon, where it reached the, meets the Rio Negro. And they basically stay apart for several miles and don't mix them. And that was always just fascinating. And the way he explained it, um, it's just really stuck in my mind. So not a linear process, but I think all these things and experiences are, um, had some effect. So I don't need to say anything more. John has explained the chronology, <coughs> um, except that I did. That's the exact trip, the, the exact track that I took from Belfast because it was on the ferry and we went across the Isle of Man. I didn't have a cabin and it was a, a pretty stormy night. There's still people at the bar. But <laughs> um, and uh, to Liverpool, where I spent uh, eight years, at my BSc and PhD, then going on to Plymouth, um, a position in London, and um, back to Plymouth, attracted back to, to Plymouth um, because of the, the people I knew there and, and the, the, my respect for the, the science that was being done. I was, I was very pleased to have the opportunity. So on to the, the topic of the day, which is nitrogen. So firstly, what is nitrogen? It's an element that is placed in group 15 of the periodic table, formerly known as group 5. Um, and um, that's the structure of five electrons in, in an outer shell, which is um, what gives it its interest in chemistry. Now we talk about breathing air, but actually we're breathing mostly nitrogen. Almost 80% of the air that we breathe is composed of nitrogen. And that's just right, because if we were breathing more oxygen, we would begin to suffer symptoms of oxygen toxicity, which as you can see from these symptoms, is not very pleasant. However, if you're a diver, I'm not, but um, I've heard of the bends, which is the, uh, the problem that can happen when nitrogen, with nitrogen when divers ascend from depth too, too quickly. I'm sure the technology has moved on, um, but I was always taken by this, uh, this idea of the bends. So a good and a bad. You will have heard of amino acids in, in some form. These are called the building blocks of life. You'll see them sold as supplements um, in health shops. And you may hear on the news from time to time about some uh, discovery, extraterrestrial discovery of amino acids on an extra extraterrestrial body. And they're of particular interest because they're seen as the building blocks of life. So looking at their presence may indicate um, a... Uh, evidence of, of life on planets or, or bodies other than our own. So a bit of chemistry now. <laughs> this is what an amino acid looks like. We've got C in the centre, which is carbon. And carbon has four bonds. One of those bonds is to an amine group. I'm trying to get the light. No, I'm not going to risk pressing that button again. <laughs> okay. So the blue one is the amine group uh, containing nitrogen. And on the other hand, we've got the acid group. So an acid like, like vinegar that has the same, um, the same group on it. We've got a hydrogen that's attached to the carbon. And on the other, the other bond is R. And basically, that's what gives each amino acid its unique structure. So it could be basic. So it has lysine, it has an amino group at the end. It could be acidic with an acid group at the end, like aspartic acid. Or it could be what we call hydrophobic, so not very soluble in water, like alanine. 
And for us humans, <coughs> we have nine amino acids that are essential. We can't um, make them ourselves. Six that are classed as conditionally essential, so essential at, at various points. And six that are non-essential that we can um, make ourselves. So we take amino acids, however, the amino acid itself is not the form that our, our body uses it in necessarily. It builds things, building blocks. And the amino acid, one amino acid, will re react with another amino acid and it will create a peptide bond, which is this bond in the orange box. So the nitrogen attacks the, um, the amino group, attacks the carboxylic acid group, and we get a bond formed. And those bonds are repeated over and over again, like a polymer, to create peptides or proteins. So here we've got some functions of proteins. Um, as you can see from this, a brief... Um, a bridged list, they're uh, pretty essential in terms of structural or hair, nails and, and beaks for birds are created from keratin, which is a form of protein, collagen, um, oxygen is transported by haemoglobin and that is a protein. Um, hormonal insulin, for example, is, a, um, is formed from amino acids and last on this list are enzymes, which are essential biological catalysts. I had fun drawing this, thought of Pac-Man. <laughs> um, so the enzyme mode of action is what we call a lock and key model. This is the enzyme waiting for a substrate, so that's a molecule of some type that it's going to work on. The, en the substrate attaches to the enzyme at a specific point and the enzyme works on it and it converts it to something else. That something else can't, can no longer stay in that position, so it's released and the enzyme is free to carry out that reaction again. So a catalyst, it's recycled. And an example of an enzyme reaction that I, I like, and uh, any of my students from the last couple of years probably going groaning at this point, um, is a, an enzyme called lysozyme. It's got 129 amino acids, so all attached by this peptide bond and all in a specific um, order. So what that enzyme does is it acts against bacteria. It breaks down bacterial compounds um, and what we would call a bactericide. Now, <coughs> this is a chemical reaction. I won't go through it piece by piece, but you can see here at the top, we've got this intact molecule that's being held at a specific point by the enzyme. And through several steps at the end, we can see that it's been broken. One of these bonds has been broken. Now, what's important about the enzyme is that at the top you'll see GLU35. That means glutamic acid at the 35 position. And if you want to count from 30, you'll find GLU just there. And ASP52 is aspartic acid at the 52 position. If you want to count from 50, you'll see that it's right there. So those two need to be exactly in that position for this reaction to take place. And like catalyst, you can see the form that they're in to begin with is the form that they end up with in the reaction. So uh, a lovely example of a, an enzymatic reaction, I think. So when you cry your, uh, or your eyes water, this is what's happening. Another groan. <laughs> Perhaps we're far enough away to uh, bring this up again, but um, I can't talk about proteins without mentioning coronavirus. Um, the corona is actually spiked proteins. Lots of them around the, the rest of the, um, the virus. And it's been very small changes to those, uh, those proteins that has created variants, some of which we know about, 
uh, and um, some of which we don't, but the ones that we know about will know that that's changed the characteristics of the virus and the symptoms quite considerably. So it's um, very interesting scientifically, but you know, hasn't been so much fun to um, live through it. <coughs> so I'm moving on now to amines. And they're also nitrogen-containing, essential nitrogen-containing biochemicals. On the left, you will um, possibly have heard of dopamine and serotonin, which are both um, amines that affect mood. Um, histamine, which provokes an immune response under certain conditions, like hay fever, um, which I suffer from. And what I take as an antidote is loratadine, works for me. And what that does is the structure is different from histamine, but it's similar enough that it can act to block those histamine receptors. So the histamine can't effectively work um, when loratadine has occupied those positions. <coughs> so a lot of essential nitrogen chemicals um, <coughs> working hard within our bodies. So moving into the marine environment, um, these two, the compound on the top left is an amine called trimethylamine oxide. And it's an essential chemical for um, marine animals, fish, etc., because when they go to depth, it helps proteins not to become damaged by, by that pressure and it also helps to protect against salinity stress and balancing. <coughs> it balance <coughs> I need a drink of water now. Balancing against the, uh, the salinity of the surrounding water. Now when an animal dies, for example a fish, trimethylamine oxide will decompose to trimethylamine. This may be new to you, but it's not actually. When you smell rotting fish, that's trimethylamine. Um, <coughs> so, it's, um, it's not a chemical that you want to weigh out um, on the open bench, <laughs> as I found out during my PhD. In terms of um, my interest in amines, that's where it starts, really. Um, I'm currently working on them, and that's what I did my first research project as an undergraduate on. Um, and phytoplankton use um, quaternary amines, again, to, to protect against salinity stress, and also it protects their, their photosystems th that they need to harvest light and um, practice photosynthesis. And one of those... Um, molecules is glycine betaine. When glycine betaine is, is released, the phytoplankton dies or releases it for some reason, <coughs> it's converted by bacteria to trimethylamine, the same reaction that we looked at earlier. Now, interestingly, that can be, that molecule can change, can equilibrate between this um, form with a positive charge and a neutral form, which we call a gaseous form. And in that gaseous form, it can actually escape the sea. And it escapes the sea, it can become involved in atmospheric chemistry. And the thinking is that it reacts with um, acidic compounds to create particles. And those particles can then become um, a focus for cloud formation. Um, clouds clearly uh, have an effect on, on sunlight and, and transmittance. So there is a, um, a potential importance there for these molecules, uh, which I never envisaged when I <coughs> first started working in this area. Now, <coughs> measuring these compounds is um, essential to, to understand what their significance is. The problem is that the concentration of trimethylamine in seawater at the high end is about a millionth of a gram per litre of water, which is needle in a haystack and then some. 
Um, and that's before we talk about the chemistry. <coughs> So, um, Charlotte Cree, Dr. Charlotte Cree, my colleague who's uh, present tonight, um, spent her PhD trying to work out a method of um, measuring trimethylamine and other methylamines. And we finally got to this, uh, to this point where we could do this. This is a litre of water in a flask. It's in a water bath. Um, we basically push, change the water to try to push the trimethyl out, out into the atmosphere. It's collected on this fiber uh, and concentrated, and then we can make an analysis directly from that. So this is a, a method that we developed in, in the lab and then that we hope to take to, to sea. Um, one problem with being at sea <laughs> is things move. So um, you've got to account for these things. And you can see here that we've got the bottle. Charlotte has the bottle clamped in place. Um, we have an instrument on board ship to, to, measure, the, um, to measure the amines and also um, taking samples directly. So we're trying to get a, be able to do analyses in situ. And once we developed this method, we were very kindly invited to take part in an international research cruise led by um, a Spanish group, um, which was looking at the, the types of processes I've been talking about. Plankton, phytoplankton in the Southern Ocean and their, um, the gases that they produce and what the significance of that is. And the acronym, you always have to have an acronym, was PEGASO. Um, so we were invited and we decided that we would do it. Uh, Charlotte had never been to sea before. Um, We'd never taken the method out of the lab. Um, we m literally missed the boat with our chemicals. The boat sailed from Spain before we could get them there. We could not source chemicals from anywhere else in the world. Um, finally, one of our, our Chilean partner um, managed to source some, flew them to one of the islands that we were stopping at. On a helicopter. <laughs> On a helicopter. And um, we were able to do the measurements. So uh, there were just so many things that could have gone wrong on that, on, that, um, on that cruise. However, we were able to visit several stations um, and uh, I WhatsApped with Charlotte about the, the how things were working, etc. Um, and uh, we were able to get some, some data that linked the, the phytoplankton production to the, the presence of amines and other important chemicals um, for the first time in this type of environment. So we were really pleased with that and um, were able to bring out a, a, be part of a publication that, that uh, indicated that um, this was, these were processes that needed to be taken into account of when we were looking at climate, um, climate processes and how they might change. And the Southern Ocean is particularly interesting, first because it's probably the nearest thing we have to pristine marine environment, but also it's very sensitive to change. So um, we're trying to get baseline, understand baseline processes at a time of rapid change. It's like running after a bus and not getting to the stop in time. So um, at Plymouth, we've recently invested in, um, the university has bought um, a new instrument that enables us to actually make these analyses 100 times more sensitive. So we're hoping that we will be, that's going to revolutionize our capacity to make measurements um, all over the world and gather samples. And also it measures greenhouse gases. And um, <laughs> there's nothing personal, Preston. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, w so we have, um, an, an instrument that's that's going to make us um, do sensitive, allow us to do sensitive analysis in much smaller volumes of water. Um, this won't be going to sea, <laughs> um, but we'll be able to by collecting much smaller volumes of water. It's much more feasible to collect at sea, preserve, and, and bring back um, to the lab to analyse. And Preston's doing a great job um, optimising that instrument. So, <coughs> what are the Research, one research question that might, um, might want to consider is um, ocean acidification. 
Now, um, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing because of the, the burning of fossil fuels, and the ocean reacts to that. It absorbs more carbon dioxide because there's more in the atmosphere. It equilibrates. Now, when carbon dioxide is added to water, it lowers the, the pH. It makes the water more acid. The seawater is quite well buffered, but nonetheless, it has an effect. And I mentioned the gaseous, the, the, the trimethylamine has a, um, one form with a proton on it, which, which won't come out of the, the sea, and one part which is form which is gaseous, which will. And this, this is an example of pH 8.2, which is the, the normal acidity of seawater, what the ratio of this positive charge molecule and the, the gaseous one would be, and what would happen if this pH was lowered by 0.4 units, which is not really, uh, might not seem very much, but it's enough to have an effect on um, the environment. And that would effectively double the amount of charge, so lessen the amount of gas that could escape to the atmosphere. This is theoretical, obviously there are other processes that, that are involved, we can't see this in isolation, but there, there is one um, consequence might be that we get less trimethylamine coming into the um, atmosphere at a lower pH and therefore a potential effect on um, cloud reactions or uh, atmospheric reactions. So we're back on land. Um, and this is part way in, but I want to talk about the nitrogen cycle, the classic nitrogen cycle. We know atmospheric nitrogen is very unreactive, um, and that's good for us. However, we need to have a certain amount of it that is converted into different forms, what we call reactive nitrogen. And in nature, that's um, undertaken by nitrogen-fixing bacteria. They may live in the roots of plants or they may be in the, the, uh, the soil themselves. So they convert um, this nitrogen to ammonium, and then it can convert into different forms. And uh, the balance of the, the nitrogen that's coming in from the atmosphere should uh, equal what's going out again through what we call denitrification, so nitrogen gas being produced. And we also have li lightning, which is uh, producing some um, causing some of this reactive nitrogen uh, to be formed, however, in a less regular fashion. So, <coughs> why is there so much concern about nitrogen? We've talked about how wonderful it is, yet it's clear that its impact on the environment is um, less than optimal currently. And there's a lot of focus on how that might be addressed. And if we look at nitrate, which is a very mobile form of reactive nitrogen, um, it's found it's find its way into water quite easily because it's not well retained by soil. And if we look at this record of the River Thames, Thames nitrate concentrations, um, from the 19th century, late 19th century to the present day, they have increased considerably. And that's an indication of um, processes that are going on on land, basically the forensic evidence of um, nitrogen inputs. You may have heard of nitrogen vulnerable zones. Um, these are areas where the application of nitrogen as fertilizer to the land is strictly controlled because those, um, those soils are thought to be particularly vulnerable for transferring nitrogen uh, to water. So more than half the land in England is designated as a nitrogen, vu nitrogen vulnerable zone. If we look at the European picture, um, and an estimated nitrogen surplus that was calculated several years ago. Um, we can see that, that um, most countries have, a, have excess nitrogen on the, uh, on the land. Additionally, 
we have the transfer of fertilizers internationally, which um, has led to this nitrogen moving within the continent, within country, but also across continents. And what we find is that the proliferation of what we call dead zones um, are quite closely connected to this, this movement and where this nitrogen is applied. Now, low oxygen zones do exist naturally, but the extent of them is evidence of um, human perturbation. And just focusing in on one of those, which I think is classified as the, the largest uh, human-produced uh, dead zone, it's in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of, on the Louisiana Shelf, uh, which stretches for hundreds of kilometres. And that is linked to the, the runoff of nutrients and nitrogen that has then been, um, that then reacts within the water column. So how does that happen? What's this relationship between, nit between nitrogen and low oxygen? Well, what happens is that um, when too much nitrogen is applied to the land, it won't be s all be stored on land. A lot of it will find its way into waterways <coughs> and be transferred to rivers and eventually to the open sea. So <coughs> this, the, the um, phytoplankton and algae that live there like this, they, they, that stimulates their growth. And um, eventually it's used up, they, they die, and then that organic matter is decomposed. And it's that which uses up the oxygen. So this um, reaction that I've got at the bottom, that molecule at the, on the left is an organic molecule reacting with oxygen, respiration that produces carbon dioxide and water. So that depletes the oxygen. And if the oxygen can't be replaced as quickly as it's being depleted, then that concentration will go down eventually to critical levels. So what do we have to thank for this? It's a process that was um, created by Franz Haber in the um, early 20th century, Haber-Bosch process, which was the first time that nitrogen could be converted to ammonium, ammonia um, synthetically. And though it's an energy intensive process, um, that has revolutionized the, uh, the availability of reactive nitrogen. And if we look at the consequences of that, the benefits, well, our, our growing world population has been sustained. Um, but we can also see that the total, this green uh, line, what we call total anthropogenic N nitrogen, reactive nitrogen, NR, so produced by human activity, has increased uh, along with that um, and alongside carbon dioxide emissions. And um, we can see that fertilizer consumption has also undergone a dramatic increase through the 20th century and, and into the 21st. So, <coughs> and I just learned this morning that apparently the cost of fertilizer has tripled um, this year. So I just want to look at two processes um, to perhaps give some hope. Um, now, nitrate we know is lost through the soil, it's lost into water. So that's the arrow going down. And above is nitrous oxide, which is a gas, and that's, um, that's lost to the atmosphere. So, we'll start with nitrate. Oh, yeah. Um, so one of the ideas of, of um, reducing fertilizer inputs is a fear that production might be affected, that the yield of the land might, might decrease. Um, so one of the ideas is to add what we call a soil conditioner. One of those is biochar. And that's been used since ancient times. There's some evidence from, the, from ancient uh, Amazon peoples that they treated the land in this way. And some work that um, we did here with Kate Schofield was to, to try to condition the soil with different concentrations of biochar to see how it affected 
the, um, the loss of nitrate, which we could see was happening. And with 2% biochar, that reduced the nitrate loss by 10%, and it also reduced the carbon loss by 35%. Um, that's important because the carbon and nitrogen cycle interact quite closely. Um, so that was good news on both fronts. And another, to look at nitrous oxide, um, I love this, this idea. Um, this was a study that was carried out in Indonesia, and it was um, agricultural wastes, which are coconut husks in that environment. And um, the idea was to use this to as a soil conditioner. And what it does is it becomes a housing for mites. And these mites can um, eat fungi that produce nitrous oxide. So by creating that environment, that reduced me at a, led to a significant reduction in um, nitrous oxide in these soils that were fertilized but had also had a soil conditioner added. And um, a study that I, I was involved in that we published this year, we, um, the, um, a global group, we scarred the literature to look for um, ways in which soil, acknowledging that soil was damaged in, um, largely globally and ways in which that might be um, might be amended according to local conditions. And that was led by Karen Johnson, Professor Karen Johnson from Durham University. I think it was a great, uh, was a great study to be involved with. So lastly, I'm going to talk about pharmaceuticals. <coughs> you may have seen these, these headlines about um, the effects of um, fish exposed to um, sewage effluent and the fact that the, the, the uh, pharmaceuticals contained within were having a feminizing effect. That was uh, in the mid-90s. And then um, earlier this century, there were some catastrophic losses of vulture population that were linked to um, diclofenac for which cattle were being treated. So these are, are very clear um, toxicity outcomes to, uh, or um, quite significant outcomes to this exposure. And if we have updated this recently, um, over a billion prescriptions um, were dispensed in England in 2019. Uh, 2020, in two months, there were over 20 million antidepressant um, drugs prescribed. And within this um, group, we have uh, benzodiazepines. And this map was published a few years ago um, under Medicated England, and it shows the, the proliferation of the, where the concentration of um, these prescriptions are. So that's interesting information in terms of um, potentially addressing this. Now we can have... Um, Concentrations in the environment are, are acknowledged as relatively low not, not low, not high enough to be toxic as such. However, there was a study that was published a few years ago using a benzodiazepine called oxazepam that um, ex where fish were exposed to effluent, so sewage effluent concentrations of uh, oxazepam uh, under a, a, a range of concentrations, but realistic concentrations. And it was found that this had a, a change to the fish behaviour. There were increased activity, reduced sociality, which meant they were less likely to stay in a group and perhaps more prone to predation, and also a higher feeding rate. Um, so this was um, evidence of some effect, even at the concentrations that we can measure these um, pharmaceuticals at in the environment. And um, my colleague, Steve Rowland, did some um, really nice photo degradation work on um, diazepam, which is one of the, benzodiazepam, the benzodiazepines, and um, found that it degraded it under sunlight um, conditions to a compound known as uh, called 2-amino-5-chlorobenzophenone, or ACB. So it's a route for all of these significant um, benzodiazepines, temazepam, oxazepam, and diazepam. 
And um, building on that work, um, we wanted to see what might happen to these compounds if they were exposed to a, river, a, a normal river water um, bacterial community. We did that, we exposed um, them to water from the River Mersey and the River Tamar, quite different uh, catchments with uh, uh, histories. And we found that the diazepam, up to nearly 40% of diazepam was removed under certain conditions, and almost 85% of the, the ACB that was produced was removed. And this was some work done by our colleagues in Liverpool, where they measured changes in the bacterial community, potential changes to the bacterial community, using um, proteins, the, the presence of proteins. And what they found was that these compounds could be degraded um, without any significant change in the community. There was no one species that was putting its hand up and saying, right, I love this, I'm going to dominate. It, they seemed to be able to assimilate that. And from that, we were able to... Um, I think this is the last formula. <laughs> um, we were able to propose a model of how this compound might behave. So firstly, we've got um, diazepam that comes out of um, effluent, treated effluent, and it can be possibly photodegraded by sunlight to produce this uh, ACB, which we know bacteria can eat and, um, and decompose. It may go through the estuary if there's something else for the bacteria to eat, um, or if it's a turbid estuary, that means sunlight can't get through to the, um, the molecules, then it might go down here into the estuary um, at where it may be consumed. Or it may travel into the open sea where the water is more clarified and clearer, where it could be photodegraded and then used, used up by, by bacteria. So we're able to do that based on this empirical data, experimental data rather than um, a model. And um, we published that, we're very pleased, and we, we made a, a press release. And I know what politicians mean when they say, um, don't lose control of a story. <laughs> I really like that one. <laughs> so <coughs> I think as, as a society, we have some choices to make. Um, we've got the, um, we have technology to, um, to undertake water treatment, for example for nitrate, there is technology available to, um, to remove it, but one, it, the installation of this facility within a, a water treatment plant costs eight million pounds. So um, it's a question of, of um, cost benefit. Um, in terms of pharmaceuticals, we've no, no doubt about how, how beneficial, how essential they are. Um, the, the pandemic has indicated how um, certain, chemical, certain pharmaceuticals are, are, have been really helpful in terms of alleviating the, the symptoms of, um, of the, the disease and, and also um, helping with immunity. And the, this is a, a projection which I think is, um, still holds that the actual um, pharmaceutical abundance globally is, is, increase, is, is increasing and it's that set to continue. And um, this is just a, an example of the effectiveness of treatment of, of sewage treatment. This is using um, primary and secondary treatment, which is the, the standard way of, use, of, of um, treating uh, effluent before it's released. You can see that we've got very variable success in terms of removing pharmaceuticals, from high removal to, for example, ibuprofen, almost 100%, through to some which are, are classed as, as negative removal. Um, so there is... Um, that, that effectiveness hasn't really changed in a generation. If I showed you another um, slide with similar data, it, it wouldn't have changed very much, even for individual compounds. So we, we have a choice to make in terms of, of what priority um, we give this, but that is, is really um, dependent on, on getting good data on, on the if, um, what the processes are. 
So, um, just to finish, I'd like to uh, just acknowledge some of the, the PhD students who have um, helped, have supervised, helped supervise along the way and have gone on to great things. And uh, also, particularly, Dr. Alan Tappan, who's been my co-researcher pretty much for all my time here. Um, he couldn't be here tonight, but uh, it has been really great and, and valuable working with him. Um, I'd also like to thank my, my mother for all the support that, that she's given, facilitating my education, getting me to this point. Um, and also my, my supervisor, Professor George Wolfe, um, who has been a, a great uh, inspiration for me and setting me off on this journey. I'd also like to thank the funders who have uh, at, at various points uh, supported the, the ideas that I uh, put forward and didn't find them crazy. <laughs> and uh, finally, couldn't do anything without the um, support of my lovely family, my wife who I took from Paris to live on the, uh, above a KFC in Enfield Town. <laughs> And uh, two lovely boys who love to hear their, their understanding of the world and uh, keep my feet in the ground. And, and thank you all very much for your attention. It's been a privilege. Thank you very much indeed, Mark, for that uh, fantastic talk. And you brought it right back, the Science Society Nexus, right at the end there. So thanks very much indeed for your fantastic talk. And we've got um, a number of questions already that have come in. Now, you'll see uh, along the sides of the, uh, the room here, those of you who are in the room, there are posters up with the Slido link if you've got uh, a smartphone. In order to um, make sure that we have equity between people who are here face-to-face -face and people who are here online, we can um, use the Slido function in order to ask questions, and these questions will ma magnificently pop up uh, on, the, on the screen in front of me here. And so those of you uh, at home can do the same if you jump onto Slido, and then you can ask any questions to Mark. We've got about 20, min we've got about 20 minutes, Mark. <laughs> you were such a good timekeeper that, um, that we've got about 20 minutes. So, so, uh, I that delay as well. Yeah, in, indeed. So uh, we've already got three uh, come through here, so I'll, I'll kick off with a couple. So what I'll do is I'll shift off the stage left so you can assume the, uh, the, pos assume the, the, the right position in front of the camera again. Uh, from George. Uh, yeah, there you go. Hi, George. Um, now, uh, this is a great question. What advice would you give to young scientists who are starting out? I'll just stand here. <laughs> Thank you, George. <laughs> um, in research, <laughs> I would say um, be curious, um, take risks. Sometimes it might feel like you would rather be in the working in the, the field that, that the person next to you is working in, where they're getting um, e data that just seems to be so straightforward and nothing breaks um, and just think about why you're doing it. Um, I certainly think you need motivation to uh, and, and have a good think about um, the slog. Um, but uh, I would say look for opportunities um, and just be curious. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's, let's go from a question about um, uh, young scientists starting out to something that's really quite technical now. How do you assure that the results coming from the instruments out on the boats are trustworthy? Uh, okay, yes. What we do is we undertake the same control procedures that we would take uh, on land, in the lab, so using... Um, solutions of known concentration of the things that we want to analyze, um, making sure that, for example, if you're measuring in seawater, that you, you make a, uh, put your molecule in a solution of seawater so that you're not getting any what we call matrix effects. Um, and really, um, that sometimes there are compromises that, that have to be made, but um, 
I think the, the quality control procedures that, that one would follow in the lab are also uh, directly applicable to, to the boat and what usually uh, to, to a cruise for example and, and usually you will, uh, you will have applied for funding for, um, to take part in, in a cruise or, or applied for uh, authorisation and, and that would be part of the, the peer review process making sure that um, you, know, you had robust procedures. I'm looking at you, George. But <laughs> was that you again? <laughs> so here's, uh, oh, goodness me, they're, they're all coming in thick and fast now. On reflection, is N wicked or is humans' use and abuse of it the real, the, the real issue? And apologies for who sent that question in. It just disappeared off my screen as I was getting around to the second half of the question. But I think that's the gist of it. Um, well, I think we've, there's a clear... Um, we know how um, nitrogen operates. We've used our ingenuity to create reactive nitrogen at a concentration that we want. Um, the problem is that we have um, created it and used it to excess. And um, nature is telling us that um, this isn't in balance. So, um, I mean, the w I, I like this term. I heard it um, some time ago. Uh, when it was described as the wicked element, and it, it is, it's both its um, its versatility, the fact that it can exist in different forms, uh, it can be a gas, it can be dissolved, etc. Is um, it's elusive, but uh, I would s and you know we have made use of that. Uh, however, I would say yes, um, we need to make decisions about um, whether we control it uh, and um, how we deal with the effects. Well, there's a question that follows straight on from that, actually. It says, well done on an excellent presentation. I was really surprised at the extent of medication in effluent. Have you any thoughts about what prescribers can do to help address this issue? Well, that's uh, an interesting one. Obviously, that's... Uh, um, there are probably plenty of people here who are more uh, expert in this area than I am, but clearly a reduction in, in uh, prescriptions is is one way that, that it would logically reduce perhaps the concentration of medication um, because if we're um, if these are finding their way these uh, compounds are finding their way into um, sewage treatment plants it means that um, they're in excess and, and we're excre excreting more than we um, more than we use um, so that's one possibility I haven't talked about veterinary medica medication which um, obviously isn't controlled, um, and, and that can be deposited directly in the environment. That's, that's another story. So, so let's assume then that for the purposes of uh, this exercise that you're now sitting in front of the House of Commons Environment Committee, <laughs> and these are the, the, the MPs in front of you, and one of them is just asking you whether or not you're optimistic, is there going to be sufficient uh, effort in managing nitrogen? So you're the scientist giving the scientific opinion, and now the MP comes back to you and says, yes, that's all very well and good, but are you optimistic that we're actually going to do it? Um, well, I think I, uh, an example that comes to mind was the recent uh, debate and subsequent legislation on uh, sewage um, discharge to uh, coastal and, and fresh waters. But, um, this issue was going to um, be passed, sort of fair, what was seen as fairly weak legislation until a member of the public um, released some footage graphically showing the extent of discharge of, um, of untreated sewage and that just changed the, um, changed the game immediately and put much more pressure on, on government to, to act. I mean there are a lot of competing pressures. Um, Farmers need to be reassured that perhaps the, um, the amount of, a reducing amount of fertiliser that's applied will not affect yields uh, and perhaps some um, reassurance while that's experimented with. Um, and um, in terms of technology for um, removing certainly nitrate and, and some pharmaceuticals, we have it, but it's whether um, that cost will be tolerated. 
So thank you for answering the MPs' questions. I'll get you back onto some scientists' questions now. You'll be very <laughs> pleased to hear. So Haber Bosch is energy intensive, energy is expensive, fertilizer prices are rising, so food prices will rise. Can we persuade enzymes to fix nitrogen with low energy requirements on an adequate scale to feed the world? Potentially. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's biotechnology. <laughs> It, would you like to take uh, issue with the gentleman who's disagreeing with you, Lee? <laughs> Are there pollution sources of amines that further confound the natural cycle of reduced nitrogen that you presented? If so, are they significant? Well, something that I would like to look at is the um, emission of the production of amines by livestock. Um, ammonia is... Um, well documented as, as um, a problem associated with uh, animal husbandry uh, and in some studies amines have also been identified. Um, they are much more difficult to measure which is probably why we're, we're lacking data. We're lacking data in the, in the, the marine environment looking at, na at natural processes but uh, I think they're certainly worth um, investigation as, as um, as a source, because obviously livestock will deposit them in um, cow pats and whatever, faeces, and um, there, there's the chance of this direct emission to the atmosphere where these um, climate reactions can take place. Okay, so picking up on sources then, um, here's a, a question which is, we've got to ask. Hi Mark, it's me, your old PhD supervisor. <laughs> So what is the question that he's going to ask? Great talk. What's the balance between agricultural versus sewage nitrogen inputs to the UK coastal seas? Agricultural versus sewage inputs. That is a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there's, we can, uh, sewage inputs, um, nitrate is strictly controlled. Um, the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive specifies what the limit of, of um, nitrogen can be in authorised sewage discharge. Diffuse pollution, which is the runoff from land, is um, probably much more extensive and difficult to quantify. If I were to, to take a guess, and um, I would say that the um, agricultural inputs are more significant. Okay. We'll get, get to some, some questions from the audience uh, who, who are not necessarily, I realise not everyone has brought their smartphone with them, so I'll, I'll, I'll get some uh, questions from hands in a second. But here's another one, I'm just checking I can actually pronounce all these words in the question. Re regenerative <laughs> agriculture and agroecology hold many of the solutions to keeping nitrogen in the soil and preventing runoff and many farming in this way are successfully proving they can produce the same or better yields. So why is so much of the focus on tech-focused solutions? Yeah, um, I agree with, with the sentiment of that question. And if, if anyone has, has seen the, um, or has not seen the Netflix documentary, Kiss the Ground, which focuses on regenerative agriculture, I would urge you to do so. I find it inspirational. Um, and really, yeah, the, the focus of... Um, the paper that I mentioned um, where we, we tried to uh, address the issue of soil degradation is to give soil what it needs, the natural things that it needs, and allow it to, to assemble itself, and perhaps accept that we're not going to know anything. As humans, we're very difficult. As scientists, we're probably difficult at, at stepping back and, and letting things um, take the course. So um, with um, technological solutions... Um, there, there, ca there can be an application to, to specific um, issues and there's also always going to be this tension between um, intensive production, the need for, for food security and um, the degradation and, and the, the water pollution that, that, can, uh, that, that can be result from that. Thank you. There was a, a question from the gentleman in there. Because they know they need to change the broken concentrations 
that makes it easier or less easy. It's a trade. Before you answer that, Mark, I've just got to repeat the question for people in, in Zoom land. Is, could better grey water usage be, uh, be, uh, be of assistance? Absolutely. Um, currently, I think we're very risk averse about um, these types of things, about thinking differently. Um, the UK has declared a climate emergency. Uh, Plymouth City Council has declared a climate emergency. The university has declared a climate emergency. Has Sogis declared a climate emergency? <laughs> My implication. <laughs> we should do. <laughs> um, and that implies that, that we need to do th that what we're doing... <laughs> um, that implies that what we're doing is not, um, is not sustainable. We need to change. Um, now currently, I've looked into this myself actually, and there, you know, these waters are classified in different types, which is very much associated with um, potential of bacterial infection, etc. Um, and th that seems it seems very constrained. However, it, it, it doesn't mean that tomorrow you abolish that legislation and um, suddenly you can use it as you want. But I think it's it's um, you know reuse is is uh, the the core. Um, a core preference of the circular economy. It's presumably if we're getting a higher concentration in small amounts of water, it's easier to treat the acute <laughs> than the more diffuse. Is it easier to treat the acute? Is the acute what? Concentrations. If you've got, say, like a smaller quantity of water with a higher concentration of medications in it, <laughs> it's easier to treat that small amount of water more quickly than having to treat it as a mass of water that has got the same amount in, but much more water is making it more diffuse and dilute. Possibly, but it's how you, get it to, how you get it to that concentration in the first place and what energy is required is, is the question. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Water change that because you're Here's a, uh, let's, let's go back to our MPs again. <laughs> And it's, this is a really, really nice question here. How could your research influence policies on nitrogen? So in all, all of your experience uh, from a range of different scientific endeavours and the, the things you see that need to be done, if we were to say to you, you know, what, what, what can you and your community do that would be most effective to influence policies? What, what do you think that might be? Um, well, scientists present evidence um, our, our, our job isn't necessarily to to say what's done with that evidence, um, and it, it is the, the politicians and the policymakers that, that that step up to do that. Uh, I think that there are that there are solutions to um, to many of the problems that that we face, uh, and um, we have. It's a question of of implementing those. So, it's. About the time, you'll be very pleased to hear, Mark. You, you've, yeah, the, the fact that you've given such a magnificent presentation this evening has generated all these questions, which is great. The, the, of course, the technical difficulty now is that uh, we're standing, or rather I'm standing, because I've got this in my hand, between uh, a group of very fine people and food and drink. <laughs> so I'll finish on a high, if I may, because then this, this hopefully will be an inspirational question and the answer will be an inspirational, uh, inspiration for all of us. From Sarah, what can individuals do? So what can we all do in this room to make a positive change to reduce nitrogen use or abuse? Um, well, I could start uh, looking at fertilizer. Um, if you're using inorganic fertilizer, perhaps um, there are other things that you could, you could do. Um, you could compost. Um, use food waste to uh, to create your own fertilizer, which is is very efficient. Um, you can perhaps dig up that driveway and uh, revegetate it, put soil in there, which is is going to um, hold nitrogen in the soil, and it's also going to hold water, which means that you're you're contributing to flood management as well as nitrogen management, and um, I feel that people sometimes feel they can't make a difference, um, but uh, also perhaps in, in terms of, of pharmaceuticals, that we know where, um, where they can end up. Perhaps think about um, what medication that you might need, or and perhaps um, write your MP and, and um, 
mention that this is um, that there is evidence of the, the environmental effect environmental effect for pharmaceuticals and and, and ask what um, what might be done about that perhaps a common select committee <laughs> well, Mark, or for those in other countries you're uh, equivalent yeah. <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> Mark thank you so much for entertaining us this evening, for fascinating us this evening. It's been really, really a privilege to hear about your career and your work and the difference you're making through your science. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating Mark, <laughs> Professor Mark Fitzsimons.